Hebrews 10, 26 to 39, we're going to focus <coughs> on one verse, 27. It's a good idea to build up to it, but it would be a lengthy study. And most people don't have uh, the uh, desire to go through all kinds of details to prove your case out. But that would be the proper way. But in a 15-minute or two 15-minute YouTubes, you simply don't have the time. This is probably multiple YouTubes just to build up to why verse 27 says what it does. We're going to blow it up. I'll go right to it. Twenty-six kind of partners with twenty-seven. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth of the gospel of salvation through faith alone in the once for all time sacrifice of Christ for sin. Back up to verse 10. This is why you have to build up and I recommend this means of study so you can defend the faith more adequately. And we're doing a few shortcuts here. But, so if we willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth of the gospel of salvation through faith alone and the once for all time sacrifice of Christ for sins, there is no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That's pretty heavy. But let's see what it means. Does it mean you lost your salvation? But a fearful, certain expectation of judgment and fiery fervor. That's even worse. Literally, a fiery indignation by God, which shall devour the adversaries. <clears throat> it's kind of a reflection of Isaiah 26, 11. For the sake of shorter time here, here's the Greek with the, the English underneath, but a fearful, certain expectation of judgment and fiery fervor, zeal, to devour about the adversaries. Now, I must make a conclusion here. We'll then back it up. A condemnation unto the lake of fire is not in view. Will that surprise you? But temporal judgment of the deliberately sinning believer who attempts to keep his salvation secure by a works is fiery temporal judgment. What does that mean? can mean a number of things. It has been described this way elsewhere in Scripture. We're going to look at the Lord's fiery temporal judgment predicted upon the Israelites. They turned their back on God so many times. Here it is, Jeshurun, the upright one, Israel, grew fat and kicked and filled with food. He, Israel, became heavy and sleek. He abandoned the God who made him and rejected the rock, his Savior. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. They made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. They sacrificed to demons. Israel did, which are not God. God that they had not known. <laughs> gods that recently appeared. Gods your father did not fear. You deserted the rock. Who fathered you? You forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw this and rejected them because he was angered by his sons and daughters. I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, children who are unfaithful. They made me jealous by what is no God and angered me with their worthless idols. I will make them envious by those who are not a people. I will make them angry by a nation that has no understanding. And here is underlined in, in the italics the reference. For a fire has been kindled by my wrath, one that burns to the realm of death below, Sheol, the, the afterlife. It will devour the earth and its harvests and set afire the fountain foundations of the mountains. I'm talking about a temporal disaster. I will heap calamities upon them and spend my arrows against them. I will send wasting famine against them, consuming pestilence and deadly plague. <clears throat> I will against, I will send against them fangs, the fangs of wild beasts, the venom of vipers that glide in the dust. In the street, the sword will make them childless, and their homes terror will reign. 
Young men and young women will perish, infants and gray-haired men. That's temporal disaster, fiery judgment. The Lord's fiery temporal judgment upon the Assyrians who conquered the northern, ten northern tribes of Israel. Isaiah 30, 27 to 33. See, the name of the Lord comes from afar with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath and his tongue is a consuming fire. His breath is like a rushing torrent rising up to the neck. He shakes the nations in a sieve the sieve of destruction. He places in the jaws of the peoples a bit that leads them astray. Temporal judgment. Pretty bad stuff. Not the lake of fire. God's refining of the Levites. Malachi 1, 1 to 3. See, I will send my messenger, John the Baptist, who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his second coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have judge men who will bring offering sin righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. That's temporal judgment, not the lake of fire. Now the burning up of the believers works, but not the unfaithful believer himself at the judgment seat of Christ. Yet he's been virtually unfaithful. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15. If any man builds on this foundation of salvation through Christ alone, verse 11, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, which will it be? Well, his work will be shown, judged by our Lord, for what it is, because of the day of judgment, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. This judgment is one of fire, both on gold, silver, costly stones, and wood, hay, or straw. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. So the men who weren't faithful won't be burned up, but the works will be. And let's see, if, he, if what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. So he's going to have his works, and if they're faithful, they'll survive the, the refining fire, and they'll be all the more refined and all the more rewardable. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So there's fiery judgment, but not of the individual, but of the deeds of that individual, his faithful works. Words for hell are not mentioned in the passage. Dr. Wilkins states, There is no reference here to the lake of fire, Gehenna, hell, unquenchable fire, eternal torment, or any terms commonly associated with eternal condemnation. Take a moment and reread the passage, and you will see what I mean. Some might wonder about fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries in verse 27, and worse punishment, verse 29 of Hebrews 10. The latter expression is discussed below. The former merely refers to God's zeal in judging those who oppose him, which can certainly include believers. We might translate the phrase in question, the fire of zeal which will devour the adversaries. Fire is a common biblical metaphor for temporal judgment, as we have already read a number of passages. Only when the context clearly specifies eternal burning does fire in scripture refer to hell. There is no such indication here. Let's see. Fix this. Okay, now I can move it. Genuine believers are in view. Well, Wilkin goes on to say, as shown above, genuine believers are in view, and believers cannot experience eternal condemnation. Thus, whatever the judgment is, 
it must either refer to the judgment seat of Christ, which this passage clearly does not, or to some judgment here and now. Many temporal judgments are worse than death. Verse 29 speaks of a punishment worse than death, the death penalty, which was given under the law of Moses. There are many temporal judgments worse than immediate death, lingering emotional, spiritual, and physical pain, which may well culminate in premature death, can be worse than immediate death. The point of comparison is with temporal, not eternal judgment. Even believers were subject to the death penalty under the law of Moses. For example, but for the grace of God, they would have, would have been stained, stoned for committing adultery with Bathsheba. And that's in Scripture. And for the God's grace, David would have been stoned for committing adultery with Bathsheba for having her husband kill, killed. 2 Samuel 12, 13. If the thing used for comparison is temporal in nature, we would expect that the punishment to which it is compared would be as Dr. Wilkin goes on, the passage exhorts the believer who has trusted in the once for all time sacrifice for sins of Christ to not willfully keep on sinning by offering up his own sacrifices for sins. A serious doctrinal error, otherwise there will be severe consequences. Dr. Wilkin goes on, this passage does not deal with moral failure. Rather, it deals with doctrinal defection and its terrible temporal consequences. Those who apostatize, who will willfully turn their back on Christ and deny the atoning power of his blood, will experience punishment worse than death. The doctrinal defection is something which terrifies me. I take great care to guard against it. May we all remember the words of the author of the book of Hebrews concerning apostasy. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. These are believers as well as unbelievers. In Hebrews 10.31, it refers to believers. And the context remains of believers being in view we have known him who is saying, Vengeance is mine, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Fearful is the falling into the hands of a living God. And that's us in view as well. So there you go. Fiery judgment towards believers. We just take a couple of minutes here. Anyone who was Jew rejected the law, who rejected the law of Moses, died physically, and was executed by stoning without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Temple judgment, not eternal condemnation, is in view here. Nor is the temple judgment, not eternal con condemnation. The theme continues into this next verse. Doctor Wilkins stated earlier, if the thing used for comparison is temple in nature, we would expect that the punishment to which it is compared would be as well. So how much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctify him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Dr. Joseph Dillow says, Sanctification in Hebrews looks like the imputation of the justifying righteousness of Christ from the vantage point of being qualified to enter the presence of God to worship and seek help in time of need. It is possible for men who have been the recipients of this sanctification to trample under the underfoot the Son of God and sought the Spirit of grace by defecting. Does the writer of this epistle doubt their salvation? No, what he worries about is their loss of reward. So, Hebrews 10.35, do not, so do not throw away your confidence, you will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. These are not mere professors in Christ, proven by the six things he says is true of them. So there you have it. First, they received the light to be enlightened. Hebrews 10.32 needs to be born again, have truly and inwardly experienced the heavenly gift, the personal ministry of the Holy Spirit. Second, they stood their ground in the great contest in the face of suffering. These people had not only responded to the gospel, they suffered for it and persevered in the suffering for Christ's sake. Amen?